Um, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining our third virtual workshop here today. We're going to be covering uh, econ how to do an economic assessment and then understanding various ownership and financing structures today. And since we have a good amount to cover, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in. Um, but just a reminder also that this is being recorded. So as we're running through everything today, you can always go back and look at it later. Uh, so for today's agenda, we'll do some quick introductions as we've done on the other calls with a check-in question and then jump into our first main session today on different ownership and financing structures. Uh, up first on upfront purchases and PPAs, we have Yael here from the city of Boulder joining us today to talk about her experiences there. And then Roby will talk through solar leases and ESCs energy service contracts and then the second main session today will be how to perform an economic assessment so i will walk you through a demo of one of nrel's tools react light and then just quick quickly we'll close out and do next steps um, talking about what we'll be doing next month as well uh, and from those two main sessions we have two desired outcomes from the workshop today first is just being able to understand the key considerations for different ownership structures so that you can decide which makes the most sense for your context for your next on-site solar project and then the next the second desired outcome being being able to perform an economic assessment yourself using NREL's react light tool um, so now we'll jump into the first main section um, first Roby is just going to give a brief overview of what's allowed in each state and then we'll jump into Yale's presentation right after that. Right. So we're going to look at four primary models today of the finance and ownership structures. I'm just going to mention them now because we're going to dive deep that you can, the city or county or Pueblo can own it directly, purchase it out of your budget, float a bond to purchase it, or take out a loan to do it. And uh, another option is having a third party you contract with them to do a power purchase agreement. Third option is a solar lease. Again, you contract with somebody else. Terms are a little bit different than a power purchase agreement, but uh, in many places, this is an easier option. And then uh, lastly, a little bit of a larger consideration, energy service contracts that will cover not only the PV system, but maybe building energy efficiency and building comfort matters. Um, there's a lot to go into with those. So rather than do it now, we'll go separately uh, one at a time. <clears throat> and then just to refresh your memory, you probably all know these. Um, a number of you can do any of these options and some of you are a little bit restricted with not being able to do power purchase agreements or solar leases. Um, what your options are kind of to help determine how you go and evaluate uh, the options on the table. If you have everything open, it's a more detailed investigation. If you have limited choices, the good side is it's easier to decide what to do. But um, it's nice to have all the choices because you have uh, you know, your city budget at stake. And now I'd like to introduce Yael Gishon of the city of Boulder to talk to us about the extensive number of projects they've done and give us a little bit of background and flavor how they came to their decisions of choosing one model or another for different projects. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'll be Sean with the City of Boulder, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, on-site solar um, from both the PPA perspective and the upfront ownership. Um, and yeah, we'll just dive in. So we have um, implemented solar through, um, I guess we haven't really done leases, but we've done the other three of the, um, the techniques that Roby was just speaking about. And um, honestly, you know, a lot of our implementation, there's a little table there that shows kind of which, um, how much we have of each kind right now um, in our portfolio. And a lot of them have been, I would say, on the more opportunistic side of things. And we've been moving in the last year and a half, two years to be more strategic about it. But they came about through we were already doing like energy performance contracting and the you know the performance contractor just said hey why don't you do solar on these buildings and we'll wrap it into the savings of the energy performance contract and so those were more i would say on the opportunistic and one of our biggest limitations has been just upfront capital so if there's an existing capital improvement or a remodel of a building um, it was an easy place to add in solar because oftentimes it would be required by code from a performance standpoint 
or it was just more cost effective to do it when you're already using like a capital improvement budget or a bond um, to do it on that on that front. Um, so as I was mentioning, we've tried to be more strategic in the last two years. So we did develop a solar strategy and we were looking at more of a collaborative purchasing or a bulk purchasing model um, using a buyer's agent um, to do that. And that led us more into the, the PPA route. We had done some PPAs previously, again, opportunistic. Someone came to us with just a price that was just too good to turn down. So we had done it that way. but. Um, I'll talk some of the considerations we made to go in the PPA route most recently as we've been more strategic. Um, so one of the things is really just to clearly define your goals and limitations. Um, as I was mentioning, one of our limitations, which I imagine most um, local governments face, is that you just have limited upfront capital. Um, we also do want to maximize our on-site solar. We have some local renewable energy generation goals that we're trying to meet. Um, local power is important to our community as a value, so that's one of the goals. Um, it was interesting as we launched into this last phase, we really were looking at resilience and storage. And just unfortunately, from a resilience perspective, storage is really cost prohibitive unless you have other funding that you can plan for for that. Um, and storage, even just from a demand savings or like peak shaving perspective, is still in Colorado anyway, cost prohibitive. I know other states have incentives for storage and hopefully we're gonna see that needle move more in the next year or two with different legislation. Um, the economic drivers, the assumptions are just so critical when you're doing analysis on any of these things. So we would create these big spreadsheets. We had some support from a buyer's agent initially, but we're, you know, as we're doing this analysis, it's like the escalation rate of the PPA, how you're looking at your rate increases over time, which is really just, you can predict it on historic information, but um, as you all know, it's just, you know, it's like trying to predict the stock market in some ways. Um, are RECs important to you? And are the value of those RECs, for us, the value of those RECs were so high on the commercial systems, we really had to sell them to make these systems work. And then we did some detailed analysis on demand savings, which is just another one of those intricacies that um, can help the economics of the system if you can estimate them, if you have any historic data to use. Um, and then the tax benefits are a big piece. Um, we obviously can't take advantage of the tax credit or the accelerated depreciation, a third party could. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that plays out in the financing. Um, and then looking at the structure of the agreement. So, you know, is ownership your long-term goal? Do you want a buyout option? You know, what happens at the end of the term? There's those flip models where you can sort of monetize the tax credits and then it automatically flips over. So all those things are just considerations that um, come up when you're structuring these deals. So um, this is kind of a wordy slide, but for me, it was the easiest way to sort of lay out all the considerations and then where they land with both PPA and direct ownership. So I'll try to kind of briefly talk through them. Um, so the initial capital expense we've talked about, PPAs, there's really not much upfront costs. There's definitely like legal and contracting costs, um, but the direct ownership obviously has the large upfront investment, whether it's through a bond or a capital improvement or just in your budget. Um, we found that size of the systems that a, a third party wasn't really interested in owning a portfolio if, unless it was about 300 kilowatts or greater. Um, so one of the things here that was beneficial is that we were trying to get systems on like small fire stations, for example, that really, really wanted solar on their systems, but they're basically act like a residential system. So the only way to finance those was through looping it um, or lumping it together into a larger PPA. The O&M is a huge consideration, I think. Um, when you do a PPA, it's respond, you know, the responsibility is on the third party owner because you're paying them for the production and if the energy is not being produced, they're not getting paid. Um, if you own it, it's, not, it's your responsibility. So if you, you know, we're pretty siloed as a local government and so it's a little bit challenging to make sure that it's happening across different departments. Um, sometimes we just found one of our systems that we own was offline for a few months and no one really knew about it. And so there's just those kinds of things that unless somebody's really on it from a facilities perspective, um, there's, I think, just a greater benefit on the PPA side. It just moves the risk to somebody else. Um, again, the financial, you know, the, the different risks is what I'm getting into now. The financial risk, um, we're, we're self-insured as a local government, so we would just have to make sure that we were covered for some kind of disaster um, that would happen, you know, a flood or a fire or something that would create, um, be able to put the system back online. Um, it's formed by the PPA owner, the third-party owner on the PPA side. And I mentioned this a little bit in the O&M, but 
um, you're really shifting the risk on the production side. So you're only paying for what's produced when you have a PPA. Um, whereas if you own it directly, you know, once after your initial investment to make sure you're recouping those savings, you really want to make sure that that system is producing and online. Um, I also spoke to this briefly, the tax incentives. The incentives can be um, mon monetized through a PPA. Um, on the direct ownership side, the um, local government typically doesn't have access to those. Um, there are investor costs, like the transactional costs of just working with an investor and um, the returns that they're expecting to get on their investment. So that does create a cost premium. Um, what we found is that it's most likely most of it is offset by the tax incentives. And so it's sort of, I'll talk a little bit more in our lessons learned about the economics and how that can maybe become somewhat of a wash. But when you look at some of these other considerations that might sway you um, one way or the other on that. And then um, I just put this in here. There's <laughs> not a whole lot to talk about, but that was a lot of words. I just thought this was a pretty picture. Um, this is part of our current portfolio. We're doing, um, I think it's close to 300 kilowatts on top of one of our parking garages downtown. And it's been one of the most challenging projects I've ever worked on, just building something in downtown Boulder, building at such high wind loads. It's a 55 foot um, height up there. So we had to go to council and get a extension, I guess, in a different interpretation of our height ordinance. Um, it's, you know, building a, a carport onto an existing structure, I think, can be one of the most structural challenging, structurally challenging projects, but um, it's going to be really awesome when it's done. So I just wanted to share that picture. Um, some of our lessons learned, as I mentioned, you know, the, the upfront cost um, can be less expensive when you look at the overall economics, but you are bearing more of the financial risks and the operations and maintenance. And I think another way to look at this is, you know, for our current portfolio, I think might be around, it's like 12 or $13 million that we're working on. It's like, if you had 12 or $13 million, what would you otherwise do with that money? And I think that's just a really good lens to look at that through. Um, and if you're going into the PPAs, and I didn't realize until this call that so many of you can't do PPAs, so I apologize because I feel like I'm selling PPAs right now, and um, I, I just didn't realize that was a, a barrier in some places. But um, if you go into them with like more of a like cost neutral, um, maybe not looking at the savings as much as meeting some of your other goals, I think you're in a good position. I think we're estimating our PPAs will provide long-term savings but we were going into it with some other goals too that helped balance that. Um, if you're using PPAs, you can package a, divorce, a diverse portfolio. So that carport I just showed you, that would be really expensive to build on its own and it would never save money. But when you look at the whole portfolio, we have some big ground mounts. Um, that, um, one of them is gonna be right here next to this one that's on, in this picture at our like wastewater and our water utilities. Um, and those are so cost effective that if you look at it as a portfolio as a whole, you can kind of spread those savings across the portfolio. Um, another lesson learned is it's just even if you're doing a PPA um, or upfront, either way, you just dedicated staff is so important. It's hugely time consuming. Um, I'm sure Michael can speak to this as well when you're doing a diverse portfolio, you think you're benefiting from like contracting and lumping it into a portfolio. But the reality is, is every system has its nuances and it's, you know, zoning issues and flood issues and prairie dogs and, um, you know, just, I can go on and on. So permitting requirements, building in, you know, landmark historic areas. Um, so it's just a real, there's so many details and it's extremely time consuming. Um, a really good financial tool is invaluable. So hopefully we'll see some of that today. And I'm you know, happy to share some of the work that we've done as well, um, just to compare the deals and just be able to like pull different levers and see what the deals will end up looking like. Um, so that's it. So why would a city want to do a solar lease? In some senses, it might be because it's your only option remaining because you can't do a PPA, you don't have cash to do direct purchase, your city doesn't want to float a bond, and you don't want to take out a loan. Um, there can be other reasons you might want to do it, even if you have those possibilities. But uh, just to review what's involved, typically no upfront cost, the lesser will pay that. So that's good, nothing out of pocket. But do understand, you know, you do have to go and look at the sites with the contractor, making sure you're in agreement of what's going to go where on which buildings or on which plots of land. So there's some people time. Also, the contract itself will need to be reviewed. So you want to make sure that 
you know, though it's no out-of-pocket cost, it is uh, hourly cost for city employees. But the plus side is, you know, the lesser will be able to take advantage of the ITC, um, take advantage of accelerated depreciation. They will have, they'll be liable for the system, they own the system. So all of those issues are to your benefit. Um, the lesser can take the accelerated depreciation. 2020 is the last year of the bonus depreciation. So it helps drive down the cost for them, which of course we hope translate into lower cost for the city. The RECs, typically the lesser contract, they want to own them. That's part of their whole financial package. If you're going to put out an RFP and ownership of the RECs is critical, make sure you state that up front in the RFP. At the end of the day, it means your lesser, your lease price is going to be a little bit higher. They're going to stay hold. They're not going to give it to you. They can give it to you and they're going to expect to be paid for it. But you can specify that that's what you're looking for and then get um, proposals that reflect that. At the end of the contract, typically the lesser takes the system and you know, you're, everything's the way it was before. You can negotiate to purchase the system. Um, it should be a depreciated system. They've taken all the tax benefits from it. Uh, the system itself won't produce what it did when it's new. Typically, there's a little bit of degradation, maybe half a percent a year uh, over time. So getting a good deal on the purchase could make it worthwhile to do. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, PV efficiency keeps improving all the time. Inverter efficiencies have been improving. They're probably leveling off now. Um, but 10 or 15 years from now, you can expect systems might be better in terms of efficiency and lower cost. So if you don't own it and you're going to do a direct purchase then of a new system, it might be better than the older depreciated system. Um, but realize if they take everything away, you're kind of where you might be today in 15 years, starting over again. Kansas City, <clears throat> when you compare some states you hear about, like California with great sunshine, really high cost of electricity, it makes a lot of sense to do solar. In Hawaii, it's a no-brainer. They're paying 35 cents a kilowatt hour in Kauai or 25 in uh, Oahu. Of course you would do solar. Kansas City has low cost electricity and their sunshine is so-so. But if they do a solar lease, someone else can take the risk and they can find projects that are worthwhile. So they worked with Kansas City Power and Light and Brightergy and came up with an agreement that was worthwhile for them. Um, these two entities would buy, install, and commission the solar systems, guarantee solar production, System sizes were capped at 25 kilowatts, but there was a $2 per watt rebate, so it amounted to 50K per system, and they ended up with 20-year leases, and the city was able to do PV on 59 municipal buildings, 1.5 megawatts overall. So despite not having the budget, not having the sunshine, and having low cost of electricity, they were still able to get solar done. Just things to keep in mind, you know, the lesser will own the system, they'll do the commissioning, install everything. They are responsible for the warranties on the PV modules and the inverter. Um, they're responsible for system removal at the end. The city is responsible for the structure you're putting it on. So if there's a problem with the roof, that may be your uh, responsibility. They're plugging into one of the sub panels in the building. If from that sub panel out to the feeder, you know, that's your responsibility. Making sure the lesser has site access is something you want to be sure you do. There's a lot of different features that can go into the contract, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them here. This is not a definitive list. The point of it is read the contract, make sure you know what's in there ahead of time so that when something happens, you don't have the lesser tell you, Oh yeah, this is what we do with that. And you go, oh, I didn't realize that. You know, you don't, you might not have everything exactly as you want it, but to make sure you understand what your risk is versus the lesser's risk going in is the point of, you know, this next uh, bulleted uh, slide. But they go and put the system on the roof. They have to penetrate the roof to secure everything. What if a leak starts? How is that going to be treated? You know, of course, they're going to say, it wasn't us. We, you know, our systems never leak and that sort of thing. So you just want to make sure you talk about it and get it sorted out ahead of time. Likewise with the sub panel. Hey, all of a sudden, you know, we start having fuses trip all the time. They never trip before you put your inverter in there. So what's going on? You know, making sure there's a way to resolve those sorts of issues is important. 
Um, you know, know ahead of time, the system's going to degrade in performance a little bit over the life of it. Does that affect what your contract is getting? Are you saying we're getting X number of kilowatt hours every year? Is there a buffer built into that? Of course, there's always going to be, what if the sun doesn't shine? I mean, no one's responsible for making electricity from PV if the sun's not shining. So that will be built into, you know, a contract. It could be that you're just <laughs> uh, paying a fixed lease price every month and you get what the system produces. So making sure you understand those uh, things are important. Washing the system is important. You can get pollen and dust, bird droppings that degradate, degrade performance. You want to make sure you know who's supposed to clean them, how often. Warranty will cover the modules and the inverters. What happens if one module fails in this large system? Will they go out and replace one? <laughs> Or do they wait until there's five to replace so that it's more cost effective? You know, so you want to make sure you know that there's a warranty, but hey, this is a lot of it's in year 11. <laughs> that module's already used. What are they going to replace it with? A new one or a used one? Same with inverters. So those are questions to ask. What happens if hail strikes? <laughs> Another option <laughs> is to do an energy service contract that will include solar with an ESCO, and ESCO is an energy service company. Again, uh, if you don't have any cash to do direct purchase, you don't want to do a bond, can't do a loan, and you have buildings that maybe people complain about working in because they're not so comfortable. ESCO is a great way to go. It can do a few things. One, again, <coughs> no upfront cost. They will do a lot of the heavy lifting, planning, renewable energy projects, do financing, in-house often, not always. Um, guarantee savings on your energy bill. Again, the city will have legal costs, site selection reviews, things like that going out, people time involved in working with the ESCO. One of the nice things is their bread and butter is doing the energy efficiency and they do that up front. That's something we recommend to anyone doing the PV system in a, on a building, do energy efficiency first, so that you're sure your PV system is meeting as much of that building energy load as you can. That maximizes its value as a building service. So they do that automatically. Usually there's a lot of savings in energy efficiency and they can apply those savings to the broader picture. The end result is <coughs> you should end up with a building that is more comfortable for the people in there. You'll have better controls, et cetera. By bundling, it can help bring the cost down <laughs> make something that might have been uneconomic as a standalone PV system, pencil out because it's bundled with those savings. One of the negatives is now you've got a bigger project. There's a lot more moving pieces to it. You're not just keeping track of a PV system. It's the building systems, but you have a partner in, in working with it. The RECs, typically a negotiable contract item. <clears throat> the ESCOs have, you know, they can make their money off the energy efficiency. They don't have to have the RECs. Of course, it's one of their you know, project sweeteners, but it'll add a little cost if you want to negotiate to keep them. One of the things is they'll guarantee your savings. Someone's got to measure and verify that you get those savings. As Michael told us, <coughs> they had this great net zero police building that the inverter wasn't working. <coughs> they were getting zero savings. You want to make sure you know when you're getting zero savings, you don't pay the ESCO if you're getting zero savings. So that kind of thing, you have an independent third party to check. The ESCO will do their own m and You want someone just to make sure they're being accurate, okay? You might hire an independent contractor to do it. O&M, they'll be responsible for it. It's their stipulating energy delivery and energy savings. So it's in their best interest to make sure everything is properly tuned in terms of building energy systems and your PV system is maximizing energy production. The end of the contract, <clears throat> within their contract structure, you paid for everything. So at the end of it, you typically own everything. It's been fully depreciated and paid for. So you, know, you have something that is an asset in the buildings, meaning your building is gonna be you know, already all that equipment integrated into it. Just looking at a typical proposal for from an ESCO, it's gonna cover so many different parts of your building. You know, the HVAC equipment, the lighting, the controls, security, energy storage systems. It can even be retail systems of some, you know, government buildings have retail on the first floor, government offices above. So a lot of different potential things that they can do for you. <clears throat> they'll guarantee um, energy savings and uh, they'll show you 
uh, the different equipment needed to achieve those energy savings. They are flexible. They work with universities. They work with cities. They work with federal government all over the country. So they have different models for everyone. So you can get it tailored to your city and your needs. And one of the nice things is it's really one-stop shopping. They do a lot in this one bundled package. Just to show you how the contract works a little bit, uh, is this mouse slide? I gotta look here. So this is showing you this black line. This is what you're normally paying for electricity. You work with the ESCO, they're gonna go and identify all of this new equipment that you can put in, and it's gonna lower your energy bill significantly. So this is now what the energy bill is like. You, however, would have normally played on this black line going up here to the top, a little bit of energy escalation every year. <clears throat> they're gonna guarantee you savings. They'll say you pay on this gold line going to here. This difference is how they pay for the equipment they give you and the profit that they make off of it. When everything is all paid off and you get to the end of the term, then they hand everything over to you. You're no longer paying them. And now this is your actual energy bill. So you have the savings here that have been paying for the whole systems all this time. And then you have the savings that they guaranteed all along in avoided costs. So it can be very uh, attractive financially when you reach the end of the term. <clears throat> uh, so I think I just explained all of these things without these bullets up, so I don't think there's anything to say, but I can answer questions about it uh, later. <clears throat> this is a subjective viewpoint of some of the comparisons between these different ownership um, models we've just talked about. This is Ryan and I's version of uh, things. Dark green is really good. Uh, dark red is not so good. And, you know, light green is pretty good. And light red is, you know, not so bad. But um, in, for yourself, you might have things that you value a little bit differently among these different features of the ownership. But, you know, with a direct Purchase, obviously that's a lot of cash out of the city budget up front. That's why it's red with a bond or loan. It's you know less cash out of pocket, but you're also paying the finance charges. You do the PPA or the lease or with an ESCO, they're assuming all of that. So your front charges are low. Um, <clears throat> I won't really go through all of these individually, but it's just a way to give you a visual scorecard as you're trying to evaluate complex proposals with lots of pieces um, again, this is one model. You can create your own based on your city values, based on your city budgets, what makes the most sense, okay? But these are some of the items that we think are important. You know, how much employee time it will take, annual O&M costs, um, you know, measurement and verification we talked about, whether you keep the racks, how much they cost, operational risk, et cetera. So all things you should be thinking about as you're evaluating ownership options. <coughs> All right, so uh, typically uh, we recommend two different types of on-site solar economic tools. NREL has two of them, FreeOps Lite and SAM, the sister system advisor model. So just some quick comparisons. Uh, one big difference is that React is an online tool and it's very user-friendly, while SAM is a desktop app and it's fairly complex. As far as which renewable systems they provide economic assessments for. They both do solar alone systems and then also solar plus storage. SAM has a bunch of other options as well, but um, not really something that our cohort as much is that interested in. As far as the focus, another kind of key difference is uh, with SAM, it's a very, it's an application that's focused on the detailed system design and uh, a little bit more information on the economic results. So a lot of times developers might use SAM to see what types of pan PV modules and panels to use, specific tilt angles, azimuth angles, things like that. While React Lite focuses a lot more on the user friendliness to give you a, a pretty good estimate for the economics and sizing that you're gonna look at for your system. And then lastly, uh, for the financing structures that these do, React Lite focuses on upfront purchases there is a way to do um, PPAs by modifying the output Excel file, um, which I won't be able to, to get to today because it just due to time constraints. But if anyone is interested in that, um, we can definitely follow up with how to do PPAs in React Lite. 
uh, while Sam does all three upfront purchases, PPAs, and leases. Um, the reason that we're going to recommend running through React Lite today is because of that user friendliness and it outputs uh, an economic results, economic assessment result that is going to give you in the ballpark of what you're looking for. Um, and if you are interested in doing something a, a little bit more complex, there is already a tutorial that NREL has put on for the system advisor model listed there. So I hate to interrupt Ryan, but <clears throat> you know from past experience, he shows us really cool things to do with software. He's going to do that today. And I know the temptation is to go click on React and try to follow along. And I urge you to not do that. He's only going to be in React 25% of the time. The rest of it is going to be doing something that is a great use of React, but also a great use of all the things he's taught you in the last couple of webinars in tying it all together. React doesn't tie it together. He's going to. So React all by itself, you can learn on your own easy. He's going to show you how to take all the information we showed you where to find energy escalation rates and things like that, your utility rates, just pay attention for the next 25 minutes. You'll have this slideshow after. You can dive into React and you'll know where to go. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Ruby, <laughs> for that reminder. Uh, so now I'm going to jump into how it works uh, step by step. But first, an overview. It requires a couple inputs, such as the site and utility information, a load profile, financial parameters, solar costs. If you're looking at solar plus storage systems, storage costs. Um, and note on that that, as I, as I just noted before, um, it's mostly upfront purchases is what React focuses on. So in this demo, I'm going to be doing it for an upfront purchase, but um, I, I can also explain how to modify that for a PPA, PPA economic evaluation later after the webinar, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, system design is optional. There's a lot of pretty accurate defaults that are in there that would do the job. And then for storage design, uh, also optional if you're doing um, a storage, solar plus storage system. And from those inputs, there's three main outputs. The first one being, it's gonna output a kilowatt system size that it recommends, um, basically using the economics to output the system size it, re it recommends. The second one is the hourly load of the building versus the hourly PV generation um, so an hourly profile over the course of a year. And then lastly, and most importantly for what we're doing is it's gonna output some economic results. So now I'm gonna go through step-by-step -step on each of those inputs on the left and walk you through where you might find that information. Um, so first uh, is kind of obvious, but also I wanted to note it because it's pretty important is creating a login on Reops Light because then you can go back and see all the evaluations that you've done and then also copy in one evaluation and create, you know, 10 of them. And the only thing you have to change is the site name and rate structure or something like that. Um, so creating a login is important. And then, as I just noted, the site utility information, load profile, financial parameters is one section. And the last section is on solar PV, the costs and design. Um, so going step by step, the first thing, as I noted, creating an account allows you to save your evaluations, which is important if you want to go back and modify something or compare it to another site. Um, so in this, in this example, I'm going to do use Sedona again, since we have some information from the last webinar on City Hall. So what we would do is log in as Sedona and create the name of this evaluation for City Hall. So all of the, uh, for each of these steps, I'm going to go through as if I were in Sedona and the applicable information there. So the four main parts under site and utility information is the re utility rate schedule, any net metering limits, wholesale electricity rate, and then the available area for PV. Um, so first with the utility rate schedule, if this isn't something you already know for each site, that's something that you'd request from the energy manager and make sure that you have that for each of the sites. Um, for Sedona, I'm actually, I wasn't able to check with Mackenzie, but I think it might be APS's commercial medium generation time of use rate. So that's what we're going to do in this example. Um, for net metering limits, we covered this in the last workshop on slide 19, but I also just included the link here um, to, to quickly click on that and show you where you can find 
the information on net metering limits. Um, so on NREL's site, there's a, a state policy inventory for each state. So in Sedona, we'll click on Arizona and then scrolling down a bit, there's information on net metering and it'll say system size limit. So in, in Arizona, the system size limit is a percentage of load, but what Reapps Lite is looking for is actually if there's a um, kilowatt size limit. So if system size is over 100 kilowatts that uh, cannot be net metered, that's what Reapt wants to know. So from this information, we would enter in, we would enter in that uh, there are no limits in terms of a kilowatt limit for net metering. And then for the wholesale rate, um, kind of a rule of thumb-ish today is that it's around three cents a kilowatt hour. It obviously depends um, market to wholesale market to market. I've included a link there where you can see the 2019 hourly or um, average hourly wholesale rate in your region. But um, at this point, getting into the nitty gritty of that probably isn't all that important if there are no net metering limits because the wholesale electricity rate the only reason that's a, uh, an input in React Light is if you don't have net metering, then you're going to get the wholesale rate instead of the actual uh, rate under bill. So um, not all that important for Sedona, but something that if you don't have net metering, you're going to want to look into. Um, for available area for PV, we also covered this in the last workshop. I just noted the minutes on the recording where you can reference that on how to calculate the available area for PV um, for City Hall. In Sedona, this was around 6,700 square feet. So we'll use that as our input. Um, a really great thing about Reopt is for, it generates a load profile for you. And all you have to do is enter in the annual consumption for the site. So you'll enter in for City Hall, $250,000, sorry, 250,000 kilowatt hours per year is how much it used last year. And then you'll select what type of building that is and it'll generate um, a typical hourly profile for you. There is the option for you to enter in the actual hourly uh, profile for the site, but that's kind of a complex process getting that from your utility. And um, at this point, a general profile will probably do the trick. Um, this is a, a big point that uh, Yale was talking about is these financial parameters are actually have a very large impact on the uh, economics of a system. So these three parameters um, I'll walk through each one a little bit more in depth on. So discount rate, very city specific, um, probably maybe around three to 5%, um, but that's something you're gonna wanna check with probably your finance department on what discount rate they would like you to use in this analysis. For this walkthrough, I'll just assume 4%. And then on electricity escalation, this is a little bit of a tricky one, um, but we actually, we cover historical electricity prices in the first workshop. Um, so I'll quickly show you how to see um, from the from the pitch deck that we used on slide eight. So this is the on-site solar pitch deck template we covered in the first workshop. Uh, if you go to slide eight, that's where it lists the for the last 20 years what the historical commercial electricity prices are in your state. So as a refresher, to figure out what uh, it is in your state, you right click and open up the embedded Excel file and just select your state. So we will select Arizona and it'll say the average annual percent change over the last 20 years is about 2.3% um, in Arizona. So that's one way you could kind of back up an assumption of what future electricity rates might look like given historical price, tra price trends. Um, so we could take that 2.3%, go back to our presentation. One second. <clears throat> Sorry, it's this one. All right, uh, go back to the presentation and uh, so enter in that 2.3% in this example is what we'll use. And then for analysis period, the default is 25 years, which um, is, is probably a, a good default to use, but if you're comparing it to say a PPA contract that's 20 years, 
then you're going to want to have the PPA length that you're looking at and the upfront purchase length the same so you can compare apples to apples. Um, so we'll do 25 years. But uh, now on those, th on those three financial parameters, I actually wanted to show how much of an impact each of those assumptions can have, which is pretty large. Um, to re re reiterate Yale's point, that those financial parameters can have a very large impact on the NPV. So in Sedona, so we'll get to the, the results of the economic assessment, but uh, just kind of a looking into the future, the NPV for this example is going to be $22,500 for like a 100 kilowatt system. And this shows you what the impact would be if instead of assuming a 4% discount rate, we do a 3%. And instead of an escalation rate of 2.3, let's say we increase it by 1% and then a 30 year contract. If, if we change all of those, all of a sudden it's a $97,000 net present value project. And then if we go the other way and say, oh, let's do a 5% discount rate and a lower escalation rate and a lower term year, now all of a sudden we're losing money on this project. So it just, it, it, what this is trying to reiterate is how impactful these assumptions are on the actual end result. So when $22,500 pops up, it's not like, oh, that's how much money we're going to make. It's given the assumptions that we're making, that's maybe how much uh, money over the life of the system we might see. So I just wanted to quickly note that those three parameters can have a pretty large impact. And then moving back to this, I'll quickly run through this uh, before we actually jump into React Light. For CapEx, uh, we, I've included a link here on NREL's cost benchmark report that they come out with. Um, and on page 26, I think, yeah, page 26, uh, it shows various systems, US average, what the dollar per watt uh, CapEx is. So for a 200 kilowatt system, US average of $1.83 per watt. And then on the next page, it has a couple different states of how it kind of ranges in each state. And while not every state is listed here, it gives you kind of a general sense and for Arizona, we're looking at $1.70 a watt. Um, so that is what we're gonna use in this example. Uh, moving on to incentives, I've included the same link above on that state policy inventory. It has all of the incentives uh, in each state. I won't click on it now, um, but just a, a note that Sedona won't be able to use any tax incentives, obviously, and there aren't any rebates that the um, city can use in Arizona. On op OPEX, uh, kind of an industry standard, we recommend just keeping the default that's there of $16 per kilowatt per year, unless you have uh, some more detailed information on what you think your operating costs might be if you own it yourself. Lastly, on system design, this is optional, um, but if you already know what you, the system size that you want, you can enter a min and, min and max this we went through in the, in the last workshop on how to calculate the kilowatts that might be associated with the available area. In City Hall, that was around 95 kilowatts. So in this example, those will be the min and max we use. It asks for rooftop or ground mount. So we're going to say it's a rooftop system. And then lastly, we just recommend keeping the defaults on the tilt, um, the DC to AC ratio, system losses, things like that because at this, at this stage of the process, um, we're looking for kind of the general economic implications and not really getting into the nitty gritty, which we'll do kind of later on in, uh, with the RFP. Okay, and then right before I jump into the, uh, I'll put all of those inputs into React Lite, I just wanted to note that if you are interested in solar plus storage, um, these are kind of RMI's best guesses at all of the inputs that we would put in for a solar plus storage system. Um, so if this is something you're interested in, I'll be sending out this uh, recording and the deck after the webinar, so you can reference this uh, if you want. But for now, <coughs> we're gonna keep with the solar only analysis and that is not the right tab. We are going to jump into React Lite, what you've all been waiting for. Um, so the first thing is log in and gather data. Um, I've already logged in, so we don't have to do that, but make sure that you do log in. I'm going to split screen so we can see the inputs that we've already walked through. 
in Sedona. Um, so first step, as we said before, is site utility information. So by entering in Sedona, Arizona, it's gonna open up all of the potential rate structures that uh, you might be looking for. But as I noted before, our best guess, unless Mackenzie tells us otherwise, um, is the APS medium general service time of use rate. And then net metering limits, we said were none. <clears throat> so if there aren't any net metering limits, what you wanna do is actually just enter like a very large number because what REOPT is doing is saying, if the system is over this size, you won't get net metering. So we're gonna say 10 megawatts because um, obviously 10 kilowatts is less than that. So we won't have to worry about net metering limits. For the wholesale rate, we said three cents. We're gonna name this Sedona City Hall. And then there are, the only advanced input here is the square footage that we were talking about, which on the right, we said was uh, 6,700 square feet. So we're just gonna enter that in. For the load profile, again, as I was saying before, we just have to enter in the annual consumption. And then by choosing the type of building, it'll create an hourly load profile based on the annual consumption. Um, for this example, we're gonna assume that City Hall is kind of medium office style buildings. And then it just generated the hourly um, profile from that. And then onto the very important financial assumptions, we said for this example, we're assuming 4% discount rate. And actually the default is the same as Arizona, 2.3% escalation per year. And analysis period, for this example, we're gonna keep as 25 years. Uh, important to note for an upfront purchase, moving tax rates to zero for municipal operations. And the O&M cost escalation is not that actually important because it's not a huge part of the cost. So just leaving the default there is fine. We're not gonna do solar plus storage for this example, just PV. Um, for the system costs on the right, we set $1.70 a watt, which doing some simple math gets us to $1,700 per kilowatt. And we said no incentive. So we don't have the federal investment tax credit in this upfront purchase example. <laughs> And there were no other incentives that we're gonna enter, but if you did have any production-based incentives at the state utility level, you could enter them in accordingly. Um, Mackers will move to zero since we don't have to worry about the tax treatment in an upfront purchase. And then moving on to the final section, O&M, we said to keep as the default at zero, and we're looking at a, <laughs> or sorry, uh, nine, um, O&M costs at $16 per kilowatt per year in the minimum size, 90, maximum being 100 kilowatts, and then keeping it as a rooftop system and keeping all the other defaults the same, um, because at this point, it's, it will have a little, bit of an, a little bit of an impact, but at this point, we're just looking for the general economics um, for this system. So I'll click on get results. One thing is that React actually does take a, a minute or so to optimize and, and get these results. So while that's happening, I know I just went through a lot of those inputs pretty quickly, considering we don't have all that much time left. So just a note that I will send this recording out. So even though that was quickly, uh, went through that kind of quick, hopefully you can walk through that at a slower pace on your own. But given uh, the time that we do have left, I wanna note the economic results that are gonna come out and how to integrate that into, um, into the sites that you have. So I'm actually gonna go to full screen for a second. Hopefully React will hurry itself along, um, but we're looking, and also right when this happens, oh, it just finished up, a note that this saved evaluations button up here is if you have a login, that's how you can view all of the past evaluations you've done for different sites. Um, but the three main things we're looking for in the results, one, recommended system size. It's on the lower end of that uh, range we recommended. Two is the net present value, which in this case is $21,500. 
And then three is this hourly performance. So it's going to say for every hour over the year, gray being when the grid is serving the site load, red when the PV is directly serving the site load, and then yellow when it's exporting to the grid and getting the net metering credits if that's enabled. Um, so what you can do is just kind of see over the course of a year uh, how the PV system might be performing given the load profile generated. Um, I'm going to jump into the economic results comparison here. And since we don't have too much time left, I'll just note a couple main things. One is this first column is business as usual. So this is no PV system, how much money you're probably set spending per year on energy costs and demand costs, given the rate schedule that uh, was input. Then it's going to say, uh, with a PV system, what's, what's that year one energy cost, year one demand cost going to look like? And from that, you can see the year one energy savings, whoops, energy cost savings and year one <laughs> demand cost savings. Um, as we noted before, that demand cost savings um, is a little bit tricky, but what NREL is doing is actually giving the hourly profile, estimating what the demand reduction might look like. Um, from that, it's going to give you this net present value result down here, um, which in, in this case is $21,500. The last thing I'm going to do before opening up for questions is the importance of clicking this little link down here, download Proforma spreadsheet. Uh, that's going to download a Excel sheet, and which is actually important. Yale was referencing a Excel file they had made. And when you download this, you can actually modify some of the you know, nitty gritty assumptions, get into the actual details. So, so, so sometimes having the Excel file is actually important. And the other thing it does is it does not list the internal rate of return on the online version. That's only listed in this downloaded version, which could actually be very important when comparing to different systems. NPV, <laughs> right, is going to be totally different if it's a huge system or a small system, but using the internal, internal rate of return might be something you can use to compare system to system. So just a note on that. And this file is what you would modify if you wanna actually enter in a PPA price as well. Um, but we don't have time for that today, unfortunately, but if you do wanna get into that, uh, feel free to let us know and we can do some office hours with you. And what we recommend is uh, from the homework last time, you had organized all of your sites uh, that you wanna do for your next projects, what kilowatt you thought that might be based on the available area and the site's electricity usage. We recommend using that same file and entering in, based on this economic assessment, the internal rate of return and NPV for those sites so that you can compare them um, accordingly. And just an, another note of something you could do is try to figure out a, a estimate on the break-even PPA price uh, using that Excel file. Um, that we didn't have time to do instructions for today, but that could be something else you might look into putting into that spreadsheet. And a last note that our website, again, lists all of this information we cover on the webinars. Um, in yellow there is, are the uh, topics. Um, so thank you, everyone. We will stay on the line for a couple minutes if you do have questions, but I know people have meetings and whatnot to get to, so feel free to drop off if you need to. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dale.